Hey, welcome to online worship. I'm Phil Cullum. Uh, I'm the Grinnell Campus Pastor, and I'm with your online campus pastor, Cody. Today we're shooting live right here in Grinnell, and uh, I'm excited to be with you. And uh, we kind of want you to know who we are as a church right away. Yeah, right off the bat, uh, we want you to hear that we're a no matter church. And what that means is no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or even what's been done to you, uh, we need you to know that God loves you, uh, that we love you, and you can look for him here with us. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to clean yourself up. Uh, we're just really glad that you're here with us today. And we would love to know you. And uh, we would love for you to connect with us here uh, at Prairie Lakes. The best way to do that is to uh, click the link uh, or text uh, NEW to 99581. Get the welcome card. Uh, it's really the best way to become known. We truly believe that we can become known. And when you connect, uh, you grow. And uh, so we would love for you to do that because we want to know who you are. Yeah. And hey, if you're uh, inside of Prairie Lakes Church, is home, I just want to say thank you for your generosity. Uh, it fuels our ministry here at Prairie Lakes Church. Uh, we have seven physical campuses plus online, uh, and our mission is to cover the state. Uh, so if you're part of Prairie Lakes Church, what we get to do is we get to give first, save second, and live on the rest. Uh, so I encourage you, if you haven't taken that step to, to give, uh, maybe this will be for the first time. I encourage you to take that step here today. Uh, you can do that online. You go to prairielakes.org forward slash give, and you can select your campus. Your and from Grinnell's sake, we say thank you. Uh, we baptized uh, 23 people in the last three months, and uh, so thank you so much for your generosity. And so we continue, we're gonna we're gonna move on to our Fort Dodge campus, which is about 100 miles away, and uh, we're gonna worship with them this morning. the good 
Hey, my friends. Uh, welcome to, uh, to Prairie Lakes. We're really glad that you, uh, you made the decision to, to be here this weekend, wherever here is for you. Um, and it's hard to believe that we're approaching the, the end of October, and this weekend we're actually going to end a series that we've been in for most of the fall um, called The Skeptic's Guide to the Bible. Okay? Um, so listen, wherever you're coming from, all right, um, good day, bad day, good week, bad week. Um, first time, first time in a long time. You're here every weekend. Doesn't really matter. Um, even though you're jumping into something that we've been in for four weeks and maybe you're disconnected from that. It doesn't matter. We're just really glad that you're here. And, and, and part of the reason why is when you put yourself in a position like you're doing today, um, God can do something. And, uh, and he wants to because he loves you a, a whole lot. So we're really glad that you're here this weekend, okay? So uh, we're finishing up this series this weekend called Skeptics Guide to the Bible one more time. Here's the journey um, that we've been through in one, two, three, four, and now we're really knocking down our, our fifth and final topic, uh, which, is, which is devotion. Um, and uh, each of these weekends in this series has been a weekend where we've, we're just talking to the skeptic in us, or maybe just us as skeptics, because um, some of us are, and, and, and each weekend we've just been looking at a, a different skepticism. So this weekend, as we talk about this idea of devotion, <laughs> here's, here's what we're talking about. We've got all these tools, and we know the origin, and we know how to exegete, and we know how to hermeneutic, hermeneut, 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 something. Um, last weekend we learned how to, how, what do we believe about the Bible, and this weekend, um, we kind of want to put it all, all together. Um, so it's been quite a journey, but, but this is the weekend where the rubber is going to kind of meet the road. And, and here's the skepticism that we want to just kind of get on the table. We, we may know all of that stuff, but, but now it's time to actually read it <laughs> and do it. And that can just feel, that can just feel intimidating still, right? Um, so listen, here is our vision for you when it comes to, to, to doing this, to actually doing it. Here's our, here's our vision for you. Here's, here's what I want for you, um, not just walking out of the room today, but like just day by day as a normal thing. Here's the whole point of this journey that we've been through for the last few weeks. Here's the vision, okay? Here's what we want. We want you to read the Bible like you're listening and speaking to God himself. That's the vision. We want you to read the Bible like when you read it. More and more, we want you to have the experience of listening and, and, act, and, and speaking to God himself. For you, for, for each of you, here's what we want. we want. We want it to be true that spending time in the Bible for you means sp spending time with God. Like, like those two things shouldn't, there shouldn't be a a gap between those two things. There shouldn't be distance between those two things. More and more when you, when you go to read, that's, that's being with God, okay? Um, now, for some of you, <laughs> it's just like, no, duh. You know, like it's, I didn't say anything new to you. That's kind of your experience. Um, but, you know, for others of us, I, I think we may look at a slide like that, go, okay, that's, that's, that would be awesome. That's a great vision. Um, it's a great destination. I'd love for that to be true of me. I'd love to get there. But I don't know, you know. Um, like, I've tried that. And more often than not, that's not what it feels like. Um, and it can just be kind of, again, it can be kind of intimidating to really kind of jump in and, and, and do it. And if, if that's you, okay, if that seems to be an intimidating vision, if that's you, I just want you to know um, you are not alone, okay? In fact, you are in the majority. Uh, if you feel intimidated to, to, to grab onto this and chase after that, if that's an intimidating thing, you're not alone. I just want to share some data and I want to share a story with you. A story first, okay? Okay. Um, our family, my wife and our two kids, we still have, even though our kids are 13 and, and now 11, um, we have a bedtime routine that we still do together every night for the most part. 
And of course, this has obviously looked different over the, <laughs> over the years, but over the last several years, it's more or less looked like a, like a devotional time of some kind. Um, and so maybe we do some material that we kids sent home with us or Kid Ventures sent home with us, you know, stuff that our children's ministry sends home for that. We'll, we've, we've used those. Um, sometimes it's looked like Right Now Media, which is a free kind of streaming video library that you can get access to through our church and, and just some great content on there. But you know, we've done a few different things like that. And, uh, and then after we interact with whatever that is, one of the kids will pray. Okay, so that's, that's our bedtime routine. And, you know, um, sometimes it gets stale. <laughs> it just, you know, you did something that worked and it worked for a while and it worked great and then it became familiar and then it became boring and then you got to change it, you know. And we got into one of those things just here recently. And so um, we want to keep it fresh, you know. You never want church or God or devotional time to start being boring. Um, so here's what we did. We, we, we got uh, our both kids um, age-appropriate Bibles and, and our... Again, our student and family ministry, children's ministry, super helpful with that. Um, but we've got a teen study Bible for our son, Jude, who's 13. And then uh, we've got an adventure Bible for Ellie, who's now 11. And uh, here's what we challenged them to do. As, as they were getting ready for bed, uh, we said, hey, build in some scripture reading to your time. Brush your teeth, get your pajamas on, and then read. And then you're going to come out to the living room and we'll talk about it together. And now Ellie, my, my now 11-year-old, of course, asked me, how much do we have to read, right? <laughs> um, and I, you know, I told you, just fi five minutes, okay? Just, just five minutes. Grab a story, five minutes, and read it. And then come out, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So they thought that was kind of a cool idea. That's what we've been doing. Um, but uh, here's where all that big setup is going to lead to, okay? About a week ago, about a week ago, Ellie came out of her room, and Jude came up from his room, and we start asking them about <laughs> what they read. And here's what Ellie says. She goes, well, um, I read the part where Moses kills that Egyptian. Um, and so is Moses a good guy or a bad guy? And then, oh, hey, I also read the part where God kills all those Egyptians through the plagues. Uh, why didn't he just punish Pharaoh? And what about people in Egypt that believed in God? Did they just die? Awesome. Uh, you know, word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, right? Um, and then Jude, okay, same night, <laughs> says, I read where Jesus cursed the fig tree. So, <laughs> it's like, I was like, okay. Because what we do is we just ask him, hey, what stood out to you from those stories? I and mean, that's what we do. And, you know, that night it was, uh, don't get on God's bad side and watch out if you're a fig tree, I guess, you know? Um, because what is, as we go to read the Bible and we have this vision in mind, what is God saying to us through that? What's he speaking to us through Moses murdering an Egyptian, right? Or manslaughtering him, I know, legal, right? Um, I mean, if spending time with the Bible is spending time with God, if that's really the case and that's really what we want to shoot for, and it should feel like we're speaking and listening to him, if that's what the experience should be, I mean, if that's the case, my kids had some awkward conversations that night, you know? Um, and I think it's just what so many of us, even when we've tried jumping in, even when we've tried building this as a habit, even when we want a good devotional rhythm in our lives, and we'll say things like, hey, tomorrow's the day, I'm gonna dust it off, I'm gonna hop back on the reading plan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I just think once the rubber meets the road, just like, just like with my kids, it kind of feels like that. Um, Maybe it doesn't really feel like much of a relationship at all, or if it does, kind of an awkward relationship. That's the story. Here's the data. Data kind of backs us up as well. Every five years or so, um, the American Bible Society teams up with a Christian research firm called the Barna Group, and they produce a big study called The Bible in America, and they're just trying to get a sense of how are Americans navigate and what's their relationship with the Bible like. And here's what one of their more recent studies found, okay? 81% of Americans consider the Bible a holy book. Eight out of 10 Americans say, yep, when I think about a holy book, I think about the Bible. And that might shock you. That's what the data says, okay? Um, and the more kind of good news, I mean, it's not as big of a percentage, but 68% of Americans consider the Bible a comprehensive guide to a meaningful life. 
I mean, most people in America still today have the assumption that there are some helpful things in the Bible about how to live life even today. Seven, almost seven out of 10 Americans, all right? Now, <laughs> here's where the number kind of drops off the cliff, right? Because only 17% believe it's the inspired word of God. It might be a holy book, but is it the inspired word of God? Is God actually speaking to us today through it? Eh. And read it more um, four more times per week. 17% of Americans believe it's the inspired word of God and they're reading it at least four times per week, right? So it's less than one in five. And it, it's an inter interesting trend, isn't it? Um, uh, is it a holy book? You bet. Is it helpful? Oh, absolutely. Are you reading it? Oh, well, no, no. <laughs> You must be really connecting with God through Scripture all the time, right? Mm. Um, now, okay, so we're, we're, we're talking about all Americans here. Like, this is everybody. This is all of us. And, and we know that uh, as of more recently, um, more than half of Americans don't even go to church. So, you know, this isn't really surprising. So let's maybe just talk about, like, church people, you know? Like, what if it wasn't all Americans? Let's talk about, like, only the people who are, who are engaged in, in, in going to church. The numbers are probably a lot higher, aren't they? Well, they, they, they are, but, but actually, here's the, here's the stat for church people. Around 50% um, of practicing Christians, so about half, um, are reading the Bible either every day or several times per week, right? Only about half of us are, and, and the numbers are really interesting um, because if you're older, the data comes up to about 60%. And if you're younger, it drops to around 40%. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're basically my age, I'm 42. If you're my age or younger, um, it's very likely that you're only reading it one time per week or less. If you're um, my age or older, um, you probably are reading it. If you're a practicing Christian, you're someone who's going to church and you believe, um, it's a little bit more like, like 60%. But, so... What I'm trying to say is this, if, if we get to this idea of devotion and it's time to start really doing it and, and you're kind of squirming a little bit and you're kind of sheepish and, and you're a little intimidated and you know you should be a little bit more comfortable but you, maybe you don't feel like, feel like you are, um, I just want you to know that you're not alone. Uh, and in fact, it's very likely, it's more likely than not that the person sitting in front of you or behind you or even right next to you is in exactly the same boat. And this is what's so beautiful, I think, about our, our church is that we just kind of embrace that <laughs> and we say, let's kind of do this together. Because, but again, here's what we want for you, okay? Here's what we want. We want you to read the Bible like you're listening and speaking to God himself. That's what we want for you more and more. We want for you it to be the case that spending time in the Bible really, really is spending time with God. That's what we're shooting for. We may not be there, <laughs> but uh, that's what we want for you, okay? Um, here's where we're gonna start that journey just this weekend. Turn with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Um, if you have a physical Bible, it's kind of right in the center. Um, in the book of Psalms. Uh, the Psalms are a collection of Hebrew poetry, really. Um, and some of them are even songs. Um, and there's a bunch of different kinds in the Psalms. But Psalm 119, the one we're going to be looking at, is pretty unique. Uh, it has a couple of distinctions. It's, it's the longest psalm, um, which means it's the largest chapter in the whole Bible. Uh, there are 176 verses in this chapter. <laughs> 176 um, so it's unique in that way, but it's also unique because it's designed as an acrostic. Um, and what I mean by that is the psalmist wrote 22 different stanzas of that poem, 22 different sections, but each section corresponds to a Hebrew letter in the alphabet. And he started with essentially A and then finishes with Z. Those aren't the Hebrew terms, obviously, but that's how he's designed it. Um, and then each of these sections is made up of 16 lines, or for us, it's eight verses of content. And, uh, 
And so, and the cool part that you really can't see in English is even though like each stanza corresponds to a Hebrew letter, each section corresponds to a Hebrew letter, each line starts with that particular letter. So if A is the first stanza, every line of that, of that stanza starts with that letter A, which is kind of, kind of interesting. Um, and so uh, kind of a cool thing about the Psalms, but anyways, there's, there's, a, um, there's a theme that binds every stanza together. It runs through the whole thing. It's kind of the purpose of the, of the whole Psalm, Psalm 119. The theme is, is God's word. <laughs> That's what every, every verse of the 176 verses are about. God's word. And, and sometimes the psalmist calls it just that. It refers to it as God's word. Um, but other times he calls it the law or he calls it uh, uh, God's rulings or his statutes or his commands or his sayings or his charges or his precepts. And all of those synonyms make sense because what he's talking about specifically is the Torah, is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which contain all of those 613 laws, okay? So that's what he's talking about specifically. But he uses other synonyms in Psalm 119 as well, like he calls it God's, God's way or the path that he's walking down. So I think it's still a good exegesis and hermeneutics, use some of our fancy words. I think it's, it's good biblical interpretation and understanding to apply what the psalmist says about the Torah to what we would believe and what our experience should be with the whole Bible. I think that's okay. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we're going to read all 176 verses one by one. Just strap in. We're going to be here. No, just kidding. Uh, what we're actually going to do is just read a first, like maybe the last few verses from a few of the stanzas. Because here's what it seems like. If you ever read the psalm, at the end of each stanza, there's something like those last one, two, sometimes three verses of the stanza capture something about my relationship or the psalmist's relationship with God's word. That's where we're going to focus, okay? So um, in the second section, second stanza, which is going to be verse 14, like take a look at this for example. Here's what the psalmist says. It says, I rejoice, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and I consider your ways. I delight in your decrees and I will not neglect your word. So just look at some of those yellow words here. Um, rejoice, okay? Uh, delight, right? Follow, uh, meditate, consider. I'm not going to neglect it, you know? Some of those are verbs. They're just actions. And some of those are like emotions, like an emotional connection or emotional response to God's word. I mean, that's what the psalmist is feeling about it. And as you think about that, I mean, just how many of us would say emotionally, when we think about the Bible or we think about reading God's word or whatever it is, emotionally what we feel is joy and delight. Like those are the first two things that come. How many of us would like say authentically, if we were hooked up to a lie detector, you know what I feel whenever, <laughs> you know, it's jab, I'm just overwhelmed with joy, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe if there were less murders, plagues, and fig trees shriveling up, I'd feel a bit more joy. I mean, fair enough, okay, fair enough. But um, the picture that the psalmist is painting for us is, is, is interesting. I mean, just what, what is he doing? It, it feels like he's doing more than just reading it. Um, and, and, and he is. Um, he's meditating. Um, he's considering it. Like, he's creating some space and some time to, to kind of slow down a little bit and, and, and let God kind of speak to him through this. I mean, it's a kind of his, his approach. Um, you know, back to that story with my kids. When we first started doing that rhythm with them, okay, when we first said, hey, go read your Bible five minutes and then we'll talk about it. When we first started doing that, if you were a fly on our living room wall that night as we started talking about it or... or, or, or just interacting together on it. Here, here's, here's what you would have seen. You would have seen them kind of come out and sometimes um, they, they had already forgotten what they read. What did you read? I don't remember. Interesting. It was 
30 seconds ago, right? And some of you are going like, yep, that's, yep, me too. Okay. Um, and so what we started doing with them was kind of coaching them on how to approach the Bible as you read it. And, and here's what we would have said, okay? Here's, here's some of the coaching we would have given them. We would say, hey, you can either just read the Bible. You can do that. And you Get your five minutes done. Or you can approach it like you're having your conversations with God. And here's what that means. Pray before you read it and ask God to speak to you. Did you guys ever, you know, talk to our two kids? No judgment, but like, hey, are you guys praying at all? Oh, no. All right, it's just a book. Why would you? Well, it's not just a book. It's how God's speaking to you. So pray. And when you pray, um, ask God to kind of speak to you. Just kind of expect that he, he might. And if he does, pay attention to what stands out to you because that might be one of the ways that God's kind of speaking to you on some of this stuff. Light bulb goes off for him. And then this one, we also kind of coached him a little bit on too. Really, you also need to pay attention to the things that you don't understand. Think about this, okay? If you're in a, just a conversation with someone and they say something that you, you're confused about or you're not tracking, what happens to your face? Right, you're nonverbal. Start to go like, and then they know you're confused. And then what's coming out of your mouth after that is, hey, I, I'm lost. What, what did you mean by that? Could you say that again? This happens all the time in normal conversations, and it's going to absolutely happen in a conversation with God as you read his word. And yet, how many of us stop to pay attention to what we're confused about? We just kind of zoom right past that, don't, don't you? Don't, I, I do sometimes. Here's what I've learned, what I'm teaching my kids, what I'm trying to maybe share with the rest of you. This number three right here is usually where, I mean, it requires some work, and that's why we're equipping you, but it, this is where a lot of the riches of the conversation with God and his word are. Come out of that, paying attention to what I don't understand or I don't agree with or what doesn't sit right with me, yeah? And then finally, just, hey, um, we built this in to our little family, but expect to talk about it with someone after you read. These things are all informed by, <laughs> by that approach of having a conversation with God, and it seems like it seems like how the psalmist in 119 is describing his relationship, it's pretty similar. It's pretty similar, okay? Um, and you really get this, um, this thread all the way through Psalms because as he's approaching it relationally, your conversation with God, that's where this joy and that's where this delight seems to come from. You know, just as we, as we walk through the Psalm, verse 24, you see the theme. It says, your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors, right? So there's that theme again. Or you skip down to 103, verse 103, I delight um, in your commands, verse, yep, or how sweet are your words, yep, how sweet are your words to my taste, uh, than honey to my mouth, it's the sweetness, right? Or verse 11 again, uh, 111 I should say, your statutes are my heritage forever, they're the joy of my heart, right? I mean, it's this theme like, all the way through that psalm. It's this emotional connection, this relational connection that he has to the living God through his word. All right, I, it's probably a little overkill. You, you, you get it. But as you're thinking about it, and this maybe my skeptical brain works this way, I start to want to ask, okay, you know, fine, but <laughs> what do we do when we don't feel that? You know? Um, that joy and that delight, you know? What if I'm just reading about the fig tree that got cursed or Moses murdering some guy? Um, like if I don't feel that joy, that delight, that connection with God, I mean, do we just jump to the conclusion that maybe, some, maybe I'm doing it wrong, you know, or something's wrong with me, or you know, we're not doing it right, or God's upset with me, or, or, or maybe we didn't pray right, or whatever. Like what do we do when that's really not our experience? I thought about this question, you know, and like every answer that I had to this question, and I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic at all. Every answer that I, because uh, this is, I, I had that experience as well. And I have to, like, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't, I really know. I don't know that there's a silver bullet to, to that. Um, I don't think there's just one clear, obvious answer to that, okay? But I, I can tell you this, that's, uh, me too. I mean, that's my experience sometimes with, 
with God's word. I feel that way. Like spending time with God and his word sometimes feels more like a joy than a chore than a joy. Me too. I think it just happens sometimes to, to all of us. I think that's true. In fact, I think it's also true of the guy who wrote this super long psalm. <laughs> I think he has that experience sometimes as well. Take a look at verse 81 through 84. Same psalm where he taught joy, delight, and all that. Here's what he says. My soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I've put my hope in your word. Like I'm, I'm kind of dying on the inside, but I'm still hoping. My eyes fail looking for your promise. I know this is true, but like it's not really my experience right now. And I say, when will you comfort me? When will I experience what you're telling me I should experience as I'm walking with you, as I'm talking with you, as I'm listening to you? Though I'm like a wineskin in the smoke, I don't forget your decrees, but nevertheless, how long must your servant wait? That's a very like validating in the same psalm. Like it's sweet to my mouth and honey and joy and delight and oh, I love spending time with you. He goes, also this, this is also true as I navigate life with you in your word. So what happens when that's our experience? What happens when this kind of interrupts this rhythm of, of devotion and just spending time with God? What happens when life or whatever kind of derails my relationship with God through his word? I will share with you what has worked for me. Um, and it's not rocket science, okay? Uh, just three words. Here's what's worked for me. Just, <laughs> just, just do it again. To start again. Did you get out of the habit because it got boring or stale? Me too. Just start again. Did something happen in your life that totally interrupted um, not just your Bible reading but like your entire relationship with God? I have experienced that. Hop back on. Just start again. It's a simple principle, but it's powerful. Um, and I, honestly, where I, where I really started to, to learn this on a deeper level was not in my Bible reading, although it's applicable. Um, it was in a little bit of the health journey that I've been on. At the, at the beginning of, uh, of this year, um, 2023, before I knew I was going to have heart surgery, <laughs> um, what I did know is that I needed to lose some weight. Uh, and that's not a new thing for me, uh, but I just, and I'm still kind of in that, on that journey for sure. But, um, so one of the things I started to do, and this has worked for me before, this year though, I started again, uh, just tracking food, just tracking what I ate every day and uh, what I was eating, how much, you know, um, super encouraging. Uh, but I, the, the app that I, that I used was, um, it was Noom, N-O-O-M. Some of you use that and some of you use other things or whatever, but it's worked for me. And when I first started to use it, you can pay for access to a bunch of articles and even a coach, some content and some coaching. And so when I started, I, I, I did that and um, it was well worth it. And, and here's why. These, it was really good to kind of teach me the psychology of what was going on in my brain as I was wrestling with this thing. Um the psychology that can kind of mess us up when we get off track. Um, for example, like I, maybe I missed tracking a meal. Maybe I just didn't do it. Or maybe I just got sick of it for a day and I just didn't do it. Or maybe I ate something I didn't want to admit that I ate it and I didn't want to track how many calories it was and so it just was better to hide, right? Um, or maybe I just completely blew the calorie count for the day. You know, whatever it was. I, you get interrupted and you fail, right? Well, if you're not careful, your brain can basically talk you into just keep on failing, right? You blew your calorie count today after being so good for so many days in a row. Well, you undid all the good work you did, so you might as well enjoy some more horrible food tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Um, but that's a completely destructive thought, and it's really irrational. It's not even true. <laughs> You know, you screwed up once so it erases all the work you've done to that point. 
it's not worth making any effort because you didn't do it perfectly? It makes no sense, right? And yet, that is such an easy trap to fall into. At least it is for me. The trick, though, was to start recognizing that and almost going, that's not true. I can, I can just start again. I can. I can just start again. So, so what? So I read the Bible today and I didn't really hear God's voice. And there's that fig tree died. <laughs> that was weird. Okay. Could you use some of the tools and resources that we give you to understand that so you can discern God's voice? You could. But maybe it was just weird for you. All right. Start again tomorrow. You know? Maybe you were in a great habit for a while, but it's been a while. And a while is days or weeks or months or years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just start again. What we want for you again through this whole series is for you to, to feel and know and experience the love and the voice and the presence of God as you navigate his word and life in light of it. So I hope it's been super helpful. Um, it's been a great series, I think, for us this fall, and I'm, I'm grateful for those of you who kind of walked through it with us. As always, it was great to spend some time with you. We got the pleasure of being in Grinnell uh, here in the lobby. We also got to spend some time with our Fort Dodge campus for worship. Uh, so it was a great weekend, but uh, before we close, uh, if you haven't taken that step to become known, uh, if you are still attending anonymously or you're just new, uh, to Prairie Lakes Church, uh, I'd encourage you to, to take that bold step here today. And, and like I said earlier, um, I'll send you an Amazon gift card if you take that step here today. It only takes about 30 seconds. Uh, so all you need to do right now is take out your phone and text NEW uh, to 99581. Again, that's NEW to 99581. But kids, uh, don't run off just yet. Uh, children's ministry is going to start in just one minute. So get ready for that. And everyone else will see you back next week.
straight I'm gonna shout and pray God will make my path straight I'm gonna shout and praise My God can be trusted All the render, the render, the wicked Sugar, great fuel for experiments, but not the best fuel for your body. Salt goes in here. Welcome to Story Lab. I'm just restocking our experiment supplies. This is the salt, and this is the sugar. Let's put these away. This week on Story Lab, we're talking about integrity. While well, we take a look at the story of some friends who did what was right, even when it was scary. Hey, I'm Skylar. And I'm Sebastian. Today, we're talking about integrity, which is choosing to be truthful in whatever you say and do. Look, can I uh, get a hand, please? Yeah. Oh, this. It is heavy. So much sand for our experiment. Right, but that's just the foundation. We also need fuel. Which is? Sugar. We're making a lava snake. Oh, I've always wanted to try that. Well then, let's make it. This is a really interesting group of ingredients. I know, right? Oh, wait, I forgot the sugar. Can you grab that, please? Yes. Thank you. Are these both sugar? Probably. Thanks for grabbing that. You're welcome. I love experiments with fire. <laughs> Me too. And since we'll be working with fire, we need a grown up. A lava snake is a chemistry experiment. We're gonna combine sugar and baking soda with the fire to create the snake. Sounds like we have to have the right ingredients for this to work. We do indeed. But let's take this outside. First, soak the sand with lighter fluid. Then, mix your sugar and baking soda together. Thank you. Mm. It should be ugh, three parts sugar. And then one part baking soda. Mix it around a little bit. You can use a whisk. Ah, yes. And then we're gonna add our sugar baking soda mix into the middle. Now, we add our catalyst, which makes the chemical reaction happen faster. For our experiment, our catalyst is heat. All right. What's wrong with it? The, the sugar mixture is supposed to turn dark and then rise up. It's just not burning. Wait, do we have our ingredients right? Oh no. Salt puts fires out. Oh, that's my fault. I'm really sorry, I'll, I'll go get the sugar. We're not gonna see a lava snake if we don't have the right ingredients. Here's the sugar. How did you grab the salt? I'll be honest, I chose a random jar and I didn't look at the label. I'm, I should have double checked and did the right thing in the lab. Thank you for being honest. And at least salt doesn't do this. Ooh, that would be bad. I'm really sorry. 
You're forgiven. Let's do it again. Let's do it right this time. Yeah. Okay. First, add the fuel to the sand. Then, mix together the correct ingredients. Mm -hmm. Three things of sugar. One, two, and three. And one thing of baking soda. And then we pour it in. And now, the catalyst. Whoa! It just keeps coming. It's growing for sure. Ooh, it's still growing. Look, it looks like it has a little tail. <laughs> You're not wrong. What should we name it? Trevor. Trevor. Trevor the lava snake. Good job, lava snake. That was awesome. When we put the right materials together, we get to see amazing things. It's also super cool to watch the flames. But fire can be pretty scary. Speaking of, it's time for... The story before the story. Today, we're in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. God had a plan to bless the whole world through one family, the Israelites. But God's people kept turning away from God. At last, they were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. After his victory, the king chose several young Israelite men to be prepared for service in his court. God blessed these four men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with health, knowledge, and wisdom. Eventually, the king put Daniel in charge of a big part of the kingdom and appointed his three friends to help. Which is where our story starts. Take it away. Hey, everyone. I'm Jen. Soon after King Nebuchadnezzar put Daniel in charge of Babylon and appointed his friends to help, the king made a huge statue in gold. Wow, what a great looking statue. King Nebuchadnezzar sent for all the highest officials of Babylon to come celebrate the statue. And you, and you, and you too. <laughs> Everybody's invited. Daniel wasn't there. Perhaps he was traveling, but Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were among the guests. Once everyone was assembled, a messenger called out. Hear ye what the king commands. When you hear the crazy music, you must bow to this statue and worship it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think so. I'm not sure about that. Well, well, really. It doesn't sound right. If you do not bow down in worship, you will be thrown into a blazing hot furnace. What about yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes, Okay, 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 okay. Let's try this out. Music, please. Ooh, it's so beautiful. In a far corner, everyone bowed down. Except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They knew it wasn't right to worship anyone or anything but the one true God. Hey! hey what? Excuse me, security. Why are they They're not, not bowing? bowing. They're, They're not bowing. They're not bowing. Oh, oh majestic, majestic King, King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar! Long live the King! What do you want? Majesty, you commanded us all to bow down before your glorious statue. You said everyone should bow down when the music plays. You said if anyone did not bow, you'd throw them into the blazing hot furnace. Yes, yes, and yes! Why are you telling me what I've already told you? Do you want to die? Oh, glorious king, we noticed those Israelites you assigned to help Daniel rule Babylon. Yes? We, we noticed, noticed they, they were, were not, not bowing. bowing. What? Their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In case you forgot. Yes, yes, yes. I'm very angry. Bring me Shadrach, Meshach, and all red Lego. Abednego. A friend named Flo? Abednego. Abednego! Bring them to me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought to the king, who was furious. Shadrach, Meshach, and... Uh, Abednego. I know your name. I gave it to you. Yes, sir. Did you or did you not bow before my statue when the music played? Hmm? Uh, well, uh, I'll give you another chance. <clears throat> 
we'll play the music again. And this time you can bow to my statue and worship it. But if you don't, I will be forced to throw you into the blazing hot furnace and what God could save you from that? Hmm? Listen, King, I know you're angry, but nothing will change our minds. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's right. right. If you throw us into the blazing hot furnace, our God is able to save us from it. Simple as that. And even if we thought he wouldn't, we still wouldn't bow to your statue. Or worship anyone but the one true God. Nebuchadnezzar became even more angry. He was steaming. He ordered the furnace to be made seven times hotter than usual. Then the king's strongest soldiers tied up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and threw them into the blazing hot furnace. The fire was so hot, it actually killed the soldiers. But what happened next amazed everyone. <gasps> Wait a minute. The king saw something that totally shocked him. Didn't we... Uh, di didn't we throw three men into the fire? Yes, yes your, your majesty. majesty. But, but, but why are there four men? None of them are tied up, and none of them are harmed. And the fourth man looks like he's from heaven. Hey, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, get out of there. Come on. Wow. Look wow. at that! Not even a they don't even smell air. like smoke! How is this I possible? Mean, How can look it at be? the robes! Okay, okay, okay. Shh, shh, quite, quite, quite. Stop. I have something to say. <clears throat> Before you all, I praise the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They trusted him and refused to obey my orders, willing to die rather than worship anyone besides their god. So, <clears throat> from this day forward, no one can say anything against the God of Israel in all my kingdom, and if they do, they'll have to answer to me. Yay! Then King Nebuchadnezzar honored Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He increased their rank and gave them even higher positions in the city of Babylon and the towns around it. The end. So they were inside the fire, and it was seven times hotter than usual, and they didn't get burned? Daniel recorded that they didn't even smell like smoke. I smell like smoke after making s'mores on a bonfire. No wonder the king of Babylon was amazed and worshiped God. So, what's our part in the story? When we choose to do what's right, others can see God at work. And that starts with following Jesus. Jesus is a perfect picture of what God is like. When we try to live like Jesus, our choices and actions can show God's love to others even better than words. Like choosing to be friends with someone who's lonely, even though no one is playing with them. Oh, or like helping someone who's tripped and fallen, even if it makes you late to class. Or you could welcome your new neighbor with cookies, even if they're a little different from you. Or if you have a substitute teacher and the rest of the class is acting up, you can choose to listen and show respect instead. Sounds like you have the right idea. See you next time. So here's the thing. When you do what's right, others can see God. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just like when we finally added the right fuel to our experiment, we were able to see the cool chemical reaction. That's right. Hey, you might want to check the label on that. Yikes, salt in my tea? That would have been bad. Thanks for joining us in the Story Lab. See you, you next, next time. time.